देखो ओके वेलकम टू रोबोटिक्स टू इन टूडेज क्लास वी विल कंटिन्यू द डिस्कशन फ्रॉम द लास्ट क्लास एंड टॉक अबाउट द डिजाइन ऑफ ऑटो पायलट something quick uh, to tell you uh, the rubric for the project is posted on canvas i'm sorry for posting it late uh, i just extended the deadline by 2 days so that you are able to format your answers in the way the rubric is uh, assigned so please take a look at rubric and then upload your assignments to the the canvas now moving on to what we started in the last class so let's look at this shaded block diagram this block diagram and i i want you at this point to focus on this shaded area so the block diagram which is described over here and let's understand what this block diagram uh it two days just uh, look at the the Uh, due date on the assignment so i think it's due friday so uh looking at the role control i want you to understand how physically it is implementing so understand that there is an aileron deflection aileron deflection is the control input to this transfer function that relates aileron deflection to the roll rate and this roll rate is integrated by this integrator 1 over s to guess to get us the roll angle now please understand that there are two types of feedbacks in this loop one is the feedback from the roll rate which is p that being fed into a transfer function or a mathematical equation or some sort of lookup table that converts this roll rate into an equivalent aileron deflection and that is fed back into the summing junction now if you look at the second loop which is little bit outside the integrator after integrating the value of roll rate you get a roll angle this roll angle is fed through a unity feedback please understand this roll angle does not have any transfer function acting on it there is no transfer function in the feedback loop so this roll angle is grabbed as is and placed back into this summing junction and this summing junction what you do is you have a commanded uh, roll so this is the commanded roll and you have an actual roll and what you do is you find the difference and this difference is nothing but the error roll that error in the roll is multiplied by a, a proportional controller and that is fed into the summing junction one thing i want you to understand that this is positive so this error multiplied by kp is fed into the summing junction and error multiplied by kp and then what you do is you have this equivalent roll a uh, rate multiplied by the transfer function that is giving out um, delta a bar is subtracted and that is going to become the actual wrong uh, input now how do we completely design this autopilot and what what do we mean by designing an autopilot designing an autopilot means determination of kp ki and kd so that the system behaves the way we want so now let's discuss in detail how this autopilot can be designed for role control now whenever we are talking about the role this is the overall loop this is the commanded role which means this is the role what we want this is the actual rule actual rule and, and what you have is you have this difference between the commanded rule and the actual rule that's get fed 
uh, to this proportional controller. So KP, this is the, the proportion controller. And the result is this actuator command. This actuator command is a positive command. So this is basically the command given by the controller to actuate, to move the aileron. Then what we do, we have this actual roll rate that is sensed by some sensor like IMU that is fed into this uh, another, another gain, some sort of gain transfer function, gain or transfer function that is fed back into the summing junction. And then with all these, the difference between when you add delta A prime with P minus K D C P, what you have is uh, the delta that is the actual rule uh, control input. So this is the actual controller input that is acted upon on the aileron so control surface. But please understand whenever you have aileron, as we know, the aileron has limits, the maximum deflection and minimum deflection. So that's why you have this saturation block. And what does this saturation block do is if your input is outside the boundaries of the deflection of the aileron, the output just saturates. So basically this saturates the output and that is the physical limitation because aileron cannot move, uh, cannot have deflection from zero to 360 degrees. The aileron could have say maximum deflection, say fif plus 15, say minus 15 degrees. So that this saturation function is going to limit that deflection. And this is the transfer function that we derived in chapter five. Now, what I want to state here is what this block diagram when you per reduce this block diagram, so when you perform the block diagram algebra, this block diagram can now be expressed as something like this. So you are gonna have an input and you are gonna have an output. So, so this block diagram can be represented using block diagram reduction technique. It can be expressed as something else. And this trans function, what you have here is nothing but this guy. So what this means is you have an input, transfer function is shown over here. This is the transfer function. And a quick sidebar note. So this is something that we are familiar with and we did many, many times. So if you have G of S, if you have H of S, and then you have U and say you have Y, then Y of S divided by U of S is equal to G of S divided by one plus HS G of S. This is the closed loop transfer function. So closed loop transfer function. So same approach when you perform, you are gonna get this transfer function. And now I want you to look at this transfer function very closely. This transfer function, it's similar this transfer function is similar to the transfer function of spring mass damper system. 
and that's what is meant by canonical to second order transfer function. What it means is this transfer function is can be represented something similar to a spring mass damper transfer function. And as soon as you have this transfer function in the standard form, the controller design or tuning the parameters or adding the PID, it's very easy. So now what I want to do is my control parameters or my design parameters are E max, E phi max and zeta phi. So essentially what I will try to do is I will use these parameters to find out two parameters. So basically I will use this to determine this and I will use this to determine this. Now what this does, this is something similar to changing the stiffness of the system. And this parameter effectively is going to change the damping of the system. And what that means is, this is super important, is you can change the location of the poles on the of the transfer function. So if your initial poles are here with changing the, the stiffness value and changing the damping value, you can make these poles go onto the left-hand side of the plane. So this approach is simple. When you have this roll autopilot block diagram, you reduce the block diagram and what you have is the block diagram is expressed form of a, a closed loop transfer function that resembles to the closed loop transfer function of a spring mass damper system. And now by tuning the control parameters, which is KP and KD, KP is the control parameter on um, damping, I mean control parameter on spring, and KD is the control parameter on damping, you should be able to find out the values that would make this system asymptotically stable. Now we talked about the specifications in frequency domain. So we talked about like bandwidth, we talked about like uh, uh, response. Uh, so this KP phi, and KD phi are related with these design parameters given by these two solutions. What that it tells me is I can change how the role should dampen out. So I should I should be able to change how far the role can go up and how soon the role can dampen out. And that is the simple design process of role autopilot. Now, moving on, I just want to emphasize this uh, again. So how would you perform the actual control? So we understand that by tuning the KD value and by tuning the KP value, we are effectively changing the stiffness property and we are changing the damping property. So that is great, but how would you actually implement these two controller gains onto the, the role autopilot? So for that, what I want you to do is, I want you to look at this equation. This is super important. So this is the actuator command. This actuator command is going to be the difference in the commanded and the actual role. So this is the commanded role. So, or this is the desired role. Rule angle. And this is the actual rule angle. And what you do is you add a derivative gain on the roll rate. So roll rate, and this is the derivative 
gain. Now with this, you would have a desired uh, actuator command. So this is the aileron deflection. This is the aileron deflection needed to achieve CC. And one thing is absolutely certain that unless, think about it, unless the difference between the commanded role and the actual role, unless this difference goes to zero, so unless this guy goes to zero and this guy goes to zero, your output or your actuation is not going to go to zero. What that means is I want you to think about it a little bit holistically. What, you, what it means is you want your aircraft, you want your aircraft to be in level flight, which means you want your aircraft to be flying something like this. And now for some reason, your aircraft rolls, your aircraft rolls. And it continues to fly for some reason, it's banking and it continues to fly in this orientation. If your commanded roll angle is zero, you want your commanded roll. So phi C is equal to zero, but your phi actual, this is your phi actual, there is some difference, which means the actuator or the aileron will be activated to make sure you go back to your original. If the aircraft is flying in position B, if the aircraft is flying in position B, roll rate may be zero, but roll angle is not. So difference between the actual and the commanded is not. That's why the controller input will be applied. In certain cases, what you would observe that the aircraft may be uh, flying in a level flight, but it would be sort of oscillating back and forth. So there is some sort of rolling motion. So you have non-zero P. So your P is not zero. In that case, also your actuator command is going to change. And depending upon whether your role is positive or negative, the actuator uh, deflection would be opposite of that because check this out, you have a negative sign over here. So this is the basic principle of designing the role autopilot. And with this, what we have done is we have closed the innermost loop of the role control. So now we have controlled the role. Now what we want to do is we want to go a step further and then add the course hold loop. So again, it comes from here. So we, we closed the loop, which is shaded, but now we need to focus on this loop. We need to focus on this loop. And this loop is separately discussed over here. Now, one thing I want you to think about, is some of you may ask me, oh, wait a second. What happened to the block diagram that was somewhere in between? You may say, what happened? block diagram, the shaded block diagram, which was in between. Once we perform this type of control, what effectively it means that this closed loop transfer function, this closed loop transfer function is has now become one. So you would choose the values of KP and KD in such a way that this guy becomes one. And when this closed loop transfer function becomes one, this diagram goes away and that is not shown over here. But you can think about it like there is a gain of one. So there is a gain of one in this block diagram. So you can think about that you have the gain of one over here.
Okay. Now, the next part that I want to talk about is how do we do course hold loop? Now, in the course hold loop, we are going to try to hold the course angle chi. This is the course angle chi. This is the desirable or commanded angle. And this is the actual angle. And what we want is we want the desired angle to be approaching or actual angle approaching the desired angle. And this is the transfer function that talks about or that relates the input all the way to the output. So let's try to understand what is happening. You got some type of disturbance coming in over here. This is the error in the course. So this is the error. This is the difference between the desired chi and the actual chi. Now this desired chi and actual chi is actually fed into two loops. This is the integral loop. So ki is integral. And this is the proportional. And there is no derivative over here. So you have chi that is fed into the integral loop and the proportional loop. Once you integrate the, the chi to the integral loop, what you do is you sum these at this summing junction. So this is the summing junction. You sum these at this summing junction and they are fed or they form the commanded role um, input. And this gets fed into another summing junction. And remember the disturbance terms that we talked about in the dynamics that enters over here. So now what I want you to do is I want you to think about reducing this block diagram. I want you to think about reducing this block diagram into this. Now here, there are two things to be taken into account. You have this uh, disturbance in chi and you have this chi. So this is the commanded course and this is the disturbance. Now, what we want to do is if we want to control this system, again, we will go through the same routine and decide the values of Kp, Ki, Kp, Ki, Kp, Ki, in some way, this course whole loop is uh, uh, closed. And just try to understand uh, something here that happens. When you look at the transfer function, we look at the transfer function, it has a numerator and the denominator. So when we equate the denominator is equal to zero and we find out the values of S, those are poles. When we equate the numerator, is equal to zero and then find the values of S, those are called zeros. Now, what I want you to do is, I want you to note that there is this S in the numerator, there is this S in the numerator. And I want to take an example. I want to take an example to a little bit further. Consider a transfer function. Consider a transfer function, uh, which is between the, the velocity x dot divided by input u. And I'm going to show this as a spring mass damper system. Because when we look at the linearized analysis, you will notice that at the end of the day, we are going to try to expand and express this system 
in some sort of uh, transfunction and uh, try to perform analysis. So since my transfer function is between x dot and u, I can write this transfer function as something like s divided by s square m s square plus c s plus k is equal to I'm gonna have uh, something like uh, a transfer function. So this is how the transfer function is gonna look like. Now in this transfer function, say you have some poles. So if you equate ms square plus cs plus k is equal to zero, you are gonna get poles. If you equate the numerator is equal to zero, you will note s is equal to zero is a zero. Now, what is the implication of this zero. Now, this zero is going to affect the output of the system uh, in, a, in, a, in an interesting fashion. So what I want to do is, I want to think about the, the variations in the frequencies. So if you look at zero, what that zero does it actually attenuates or reduces the response when the frequencies are very close to zero. Now, what that means is, let me write down the canonical transfer function. If I express this transfer function into a form, S is equal to S square plus two, omega n zeta s plus omega n square. And I'm gonna say here, uh, this is the ratio between the output divided by input. Now I want you to think about the input as some sort of sine wave. And the frequency of the sine wave, the frequency of the omega is much, much less than omega n. Frequency of the sine wave is much, much less than omega n. Now, in that case, we can reasonably approximate value of s, it's very, very close to zero. So it's, it's very small. Now, when S is equal to approaching zero or S is very small, if you were to look at the output of the system for this input, this is the input. If you look at the output of the system for this input, it's going to be very, very small. What that means is you'll observe that the system response is going to be flat. In other words, this system would filter out the, the, the oscillations. So that, that is what is indicated over here. So I want you to think about this phase and magnitude plot and the, the plot of T times omega N versus uh, magnitude ratio in terms of damping. And you will notice when the values of frequency are very small. When the values of frequency very small, system does not exhibit any response. The system does not exhibit any response. In other words, it the oscillations are filtered. The oscillations are filtered. And this is an important observation when you have a zero in the numerator. So if you look at this transfer function, 
the canonical means the representative transfer function you will observe in this transfer function you have one zero and you have uh, two poles and this is going to attenuate the response of the system now what is the implication of that on the course hold so in other words if you have uh, oscillations in the course hold then those oscillations will be attenuated by this zero in the numerator so if you look at this course hold loop you would notice that you will have uh, as i we talked about this is the commanded course so command and this is the disturbance and now i would choose the values of ki and values of kp in such a way that this loop is closed and if you are wondering what is this this is the roll loop closed so this guy is the roll loop closed now all said and done how would you implement this so when you are going in this it will be implemented as a proportional controller on the desired uh, course difference between the desired course and the actual course which is the error and an integral term on the error which is the desired course and actual course so when you are trying to design a course hold loop what you will do is you will have a proportional and an integral control so you will use a p and i control and the advantage of this p and i control is you would be able to cancel out the oscillations and maintain the commanded uh, course the next thing we talked about briefly is something called as the yaw damper so what is the purpose of the yaw damper is we talked about roll and yaw coupling so whenever you have certain roll that roll results into uh, some yaw in certain cases that yaw is desired and in some some cases that yaw is not desired so consider you are flying an aircraft that has rudder and you don't want any roll to yaw coupling so what you will do is to cancel out the undesired effect of roll on yaw you would have a yaw damper and this yaw damper is going to actually activate the rudder it's going to actuate the rudder so that the undesired yaw is cancelled out so if you look at this yaw damper transfer function the yaw damper transfer function uh, the numerator is the second order transfer function and the denominator is the third order transfer function and what you have is you have a filter that is going to be used to filter the yaw rate so what you have is you have a filter that is going to filter out the yaw rate and then that actually gets fed and multiplied with a kr coefficient that is the controller coefficient and that is fed at the summing junction and then that provides a command and please understand this command is negative because we are trying to cancel out the effect of undesired yaw so it is not like we want to amplify that effect what we want to do is we want to compensate the undesired effect Uh, of roll so this yaw damper will help us minimize roll and yaw coupling now from transfer function point of view this looks okay but how do we actually implement it and the implementation of yaw damper 
is similar to the implementation that we talked about uh, earlier for controller. It will be represented something like uh, uh, a PID type of control, which means if you look at the your damper control equation, this your damper control equation is going to be like this. If you convert this into a time domain, you would have the raw, uh, your damper equation, something like this, wherein you have the, the yaw rate, the damper rate is equal to the actual deflection divided by the time constant plus the coefficient multiplied by uh, the rate of change of um, yaw rate. So, and then to express this as an integral equation, you can integrate this and now this is the actual command that will be implemented in the autopilot. So now what does this mean? This means that if you have some sort of non-zero yaw rate, if you have some sort of non-zero yaw rate, that is because of the roll and yaw coupling, your rudder will be actuated. In addition to that, if you have any rudder disturbance, that is because of the roll and yaw coupling, what you will do is you will integrate that or you will try to find out the overall effect of that uh, instability or that disturbance and divide that by the time constant and that will be added as the negative input onto the the rudder commanding signal. And that is how the yaw damper will be implemented. And again, this may seem complicated, but this is actually not that complicated. So think about it, that you have an undesired yaw. So you rolled or banked the aircraft and the aircraft started yawing. And when the aircraft started yawing, obviously you are gonna get a non-zero yaw rate. And then what you wanna do is, you want to compensate the effect of that non-zero yaw rate, and you want to compensate the effect of non-zero yaw that has occurred since the roll has started. So this term is going to compensate for that. And that's what this integral sign means, which means you are going to integrate or you are gonna accumulate that effect. Uh, so this is, it is from minus infinity, which means from, from the beginning. Typically, when you try to uh, solve this type of problem, this integral equation is written as a continuous equation, but when we implement this on autopilot, you will always have a discrete implementation, which means this, this equation will be executed in loop again and again and again and again, and that will give you the correct value. Okay, now I want to quickly summarize the lateral autopilot. So what are the design parameters for lateral autopilot? And this information is super useful when you do the next project. So the, the for lateral autopilot, if you want to stabilize the inner loop, which is like roll attitude hold, you would actually decide the stiffness and the damping for the inner loop. So basically you would choose certain value of omega n and certain value of zeta that would ensure that the attitude, roll attitude hold is stable. Then outer loop for lateral autopilot is the course hold. And for course hold, what you wanna do is, you want to choose the bandwidth or uh, W chi that separates between the roll and the course loop. And then you, uh, you add this damping for the course hold that ensures that the outer loop is closed. And in certain cases, if you want to minimize the roll and your coupling, so to minimize roll and your coupling, 
and rudder is available then what you do is you implement some sort of cutoff frequency uh, for the filter and this filter is implemented here and you will have a gain for the yaw damper that would add the stability or mini and minimize the roll and yaw coupling so many a times what we have to do is this autopilot is tuned uh, from some experiments and understand tuning these gains is not a trivial task so how would you do it and and the issue is though you have an autopilot and you probably have an aircraft in mind and you have probably uh, some some numbers related to the the mechanical properties inertia you know the transfer function in the actual aircraft those values could change so even though you have some theoretical gains those gains need to be tuned when the aircraft actually flies so for an example what you do is this is these are the guidelines so what we do is first increase the kd to the point that it uh, the aircraft sort of becomes unstable and then back off which means you are now inside on the left hand side of the the plane so imaginary uh, axis and then you tune the kp response or tune the proportional gain to to get acceptable step response and a quick recollection here uh, in last class robotics one when we use the matlab toolbox for pid gain we did something similar so if you have any concerns or if you just want to revise just go back to that video lecture where we did something like this wherein we first adjusted the derivative gain and then we adjusted the proportional gain to get the appropriate response same thing for the outer hold but please note the outer hold this is the difference you have pd control on the inner loop the innermost loop and in outer loop outer loop you have pi control so always you start with first you you actually tune the derivative then you tune the proportional and then you tune the integral control so that's what since there is no derivative you start with proportional control tuning so that you get acceptable step response and then you tune the integral gain to remove the steady state error and if you have to add side slip hold which means if you want to hold beta is equal to constant what you are going to do is here check this out again here you have p and you have i you have a proportional gain and you have an integral gain so you will always go in this sequence derivative first proportional gain next and the integral gain last Uh, or you can actually use matlab pid tuner toolbox and it will do the tuning the way you want now next part is a little bit interesting this is the the design or or tuning of autopilot in the longitudinal flight regimes which means aircraft is flying in the longitudinal direction now what you have is let's try to understand what exactly happens to the aircraft in the longitudinal flight regime so first and foremost the aircraft is on the ground so you have this aircraft this aircraft is on the ground and then the it starts uh, its thrusters or the engines and the aircraft starts moving once it achieves the certain speed certain air speed what you do is the the elevators are lifted or uh, elevators are uh, actuated and the aircraft kind of takes off now so during the take off your throttle is full so during the th uh, aircraft uh, when the aircraft is taking off the throttle is full so you have full thrust 
of the aircraft. And then what we are trying to do is we are trying to regulate the pitch so that the aircraft pitches up at the commanded pitch. So this is theta C. And initially, when the aircraft is sort of taking off, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you maintain that commanded pitch so that the aircraft goes to the desired uh, altitude. So H desired. And once you get to the desired altitude, at that point, then you can reduce the, uh, the amount of thrust. So, so throttle can be reduced. And then if you want to maintain the level flight, you actually use pitch and throttle to control the, the altitude. So now, how it, does this happen? So what I want to talk about is consider the aircraft has taken off and aircraft is flying at a desired uh, altitude. So this is H desired. Now, if I were to increase the throttle, if I were to increase the throttle, the airspeed would increase. Increase in airspeed would increase the lift. That means the aircraft will go up. Because naturally, if your airspeed is increased, uh, you are one half rho v square, the dynamic pressure increased. Dynamic pressure multiplied by the coefficient of lift multiplied by the wing area gives you the, the upward force, the lift, and the aircraft gets lifted up. And at that time, what you do is you control the pitch so that the ang effective angle of attack on the aircraft is controlled. Effective angle of attack on the aircraft is controlled. So angle of attack is reduced then the CL uh, coefficient of lift is reduced and aircraft is maintained in the level flight. So when you are trying to maintain the aircraft in the level flight, you would be commanding pitch and throttle. So you want to make sure that the right combination of pitch and throttle is used so that the aircraft maintains level flight. And this is continuously changing. So depending upon, for an example, all of a sudden you have a headwind or if you have a tailwind that will affect the airspeed. A change in the airspeed will cause change in the lift. Change in the lift will cause aircraft to go up or to come down. And at that point, what you want to do is either you change the throttle or you change the, the pitch angle and make sure that the aircraft is in the level flight. So these are different states and you want to switch from one state to other state depending upon few if then type of conditions and that is where we talked about the state flow comes in picture so you have state one you have state two and then what happens is depending upon the certain values your state can transition back and forth. So the aircraft, so for example, you have the command and you have the throttle. So what you can do is, depending upon certain if conditions, you would activate the pitch. On certain conditions, you would activate the throttle. So in state, basically, uh, state, uh, transitions are dictated by the transition variables or the combination of variables that allow you to make sure that this state flow achieves the desired performance. And I hope you have done the, the tutorial and the webinar on the state flow using Mat MATLAB. In that you will be, you might have discussed what, how to construct the state flow machines. And the state flow machine is actually going to ensure that if certain conditions are met, certain tasks are performed. So now before we start uh, diving deep into the, the equations, a quick recap. These are the equations that we got 
from last chapter, chapter five, and recognize these are the equations for the pitch. The pitch rate is equal to Q cosine uh, phi minus R sine phi. And after simplification, what we do is we came up with the second order equation that is shown over here. So this is the equation that was used to construct the transfer function. And if you look at the longitudinal transfer function that we constructed using this equation, this is the longitudinal transfer function that we constructed. And again, these notes are from the, the last lesson wherein we discuss in chapter five, how this longitudinal transfer function was constructed. And then again, we have this block diagram. This block diagram indicates the relationship between the input, which is the elevator input and the pitch angle. So this is the elevator input. The elevator input gets fed to a summing junction. On summing junction, you have the disturbance and disturbance and elevator, uh, ele um, elevator input get fed into this transfer function. But please note, this is similar to the transfer function of the second order system. So what we need to do is we have to follow the same approach wherein we will come up with a controller, we will construct a canonical uh, second order transfer function and then uh, come up with the PID control gains. So if you think about it, this is all the stuff that we discussed in last class. This is again the, the attitude, uh, altitude hold. So this is the transfer function for the altitude. And what happens is this gets appended to the pitch equation. And then we talked about the effect of airspeed. And then we looked at the equation that provides us the airspeed. And all said and done, what we do is we go through these equations, we linearize, we trim, and finally, finally, we land up with this transfer function. And this is the linearized approximation of this complicated nonlinear equation. And when we are talking about uh, this equation in chapter five, I kind of talked about successive loop closure. So let's try to see how these loop closures are implemented. So let's look at the innermost loop. Innermost loop, is we want to hold the pitch angle at certain constant value. So again, just to give you an idea, this is the pitch angle. This is the pitch rate. This is the transfer function that relates the elevator command to the resultant pitch rate, pitch rate when integrated, this is an integrator. When pitch rate is integrated, we get the pitch angle. And on this pitch rate, what we have is, we have a sort of a derivative uh, gain, and that is actually fed back to the elevator command. And again, we have, a proportional gain over here. That is going to be acted upon on the difference between the commanded pitch. This is the commanded pitch. And this is the actual pitch. So this is exactly similar of the form of the roll control loop. So what you have is you have a, a closed loop transfer function. 
This closed loop transfer function is sort of a canonical second order transfer function. The only difference here is it has a non unity DC gain. The gain is not one. So what you can do is you can actually equate the coefficients and then find out the values of the proportional gain and the derivative gain. So this is proportional and this is derivative. And then finally, if you want to find out what is this non-zero, non-unity gain, what, what it means, so this is not equal to one. So if you want to find out what is the value of non uh, uh, the, the DC gain, then what you do is uh, equate uh, this coefficient and with this equation and you land up with the value of KD. And when you implement this, again, once we find out the value of KP and KD, the implementation is something similar as the, the rule input. And you will actually have an actuator command that will be dependent on difference between the, the commanded pitch and the actual pitch and uh, pitch rate. So pitch rate and the difference. So you will be controlling this guy, you will be controlling this guy. Okay. Before I proceed further, I just want to make sure that everyone understood up to this part. Any questions here? One thing uh, you may think that this, this, these are a lot of mathematical equations, but actually they are not. Uh, I want you to understand the physical interpretation. So finally, what we are doing is the linearized model that we de derived in last chapter. Now we are designing the PID control so that those linearized systems uh, can be controlled. And this is how we actually tune or we find the values of uh, PID gains so that the autopilot is able to control uh, different, different uh, states. Next step is altitude hold using the commanded pitch. So you have an inner loop. And now what you have is you have this altitude hold loop. And this actually looks similar to the lateral autopilot. So once the inner loop is controlled, now what we do is we have to go to the outer loop and look at this outer loop. It has a proportional gain. This is a proportional gain. And then you have an integral gain. And everything else, the, the values of KD, so this guy from here onwards, here onwards, we already took care of it. So this is taken care of in the previous uh, iteration. So once you find out the values of KD and KP, so say we are assuming that this guy is known, this guy is known, so this loop is closed and now what we have is we have the altitude uh, hold using commanded pitch and let's look at that in a little bit uh, detail so this the the loop i actually uh, added a rectangle i highlighted is now represented as a dc gain now if you look at the closed loop transfer function for the the altitude, this is the altitude. This is the commanded altitude, the actual, this is commanded.
and th this guy is the disturbance. So what you have is again, all the terms that we found out earlier, they are popping in, but in addition to that, you have these terms, KIH, KPH, and these terms need to be determined. So what we do is we implement a PI control, proportional and integral control that ensures that the actual altitude maintain uh, close to the commanded altitude and the disturbance is canceled out. So once again, the same drill, we are going to equate the transfer functions. And then once we equate the transfer function, we find out the values of integral gain and we find out the proportional gain. And these two gains can be tuned depending upon your desired uh, flight parameters or desired performance parameters. So this is exactly the same process what earlier. The next thing is airspeed holding throttle. So the last loop that we want to talk about is control of airspeed. So this is the actual airspeed. And this is the controlled or con desired. And as you can see that there is an integral loop, so integral gain, and there is a proportional gain. And then what you have is you have the throttle here, and that is acted upon by the disturbance. And this is the actual transfer function. So when you expand the transfer function, what you have is you have the commanded airspeed and you have the disturbance. And once again, I want you to look at these equations, believe it or not, this is again, sort of a transfer function of second order system. And this is also sort of a transfer function of the second order system, but you have a zero. That means you have an S present in the numerator. And then what happens is since it has a zero, it rejects the low frequency disturbances, and then you will be able to ensure a, a, a constant airspeed. So how do we actually tune the gains? Same thing, express this transfer function as a canonical transfer function in the second order form and tune the integral gain and the proportional gain based on the frequency and the damping that is desired. So once you have des designed this uh, uh, throttle control, you will determine the integral gain and the proportional gain that will ensure the, uh, the airspeed control. Now, we talked about this longitudinal flight regimes. So once again, I want you to think about different states that you have over here. So for an example, you have one state over here. You have one state over here and you have one state over here. And these states have some sort of dependencies. So you are gonna control the state transition based on where the aircraft is and then what is happening onto the aircraft what are the values of the throttle? What is the value of the altitude? What is the value of uh, uh, pitch angle? And you can actually write a state machine that will transfer the state or that will take aircraft from one state to other state or depending upon 
what are the certain values of altitude what are the values of pitch it will uh, add certain commands now there is an alternate to state machines uh, in other words you can actually eliminate the state machines by adding the the controls uh, but that we are not going to discuss in detail uh, we will will stick to the state machine based uh, control so how so this is the summary how do you tune when the aircraft is flying uh, for longitudinal autopilot similar to the what we discussed first we want to control the derivative gain then we want to control the proportional gain we want to control the integral gain so for the inner loop first change the derivative once you are happy with the derivative change the proportional when you are trying to do the altitude hold this is pi control loop so first control p and then control i same thing this is pi this is pd so first control p then control i was first control p then control i and this is little bit of trial and error so once we do the the project and some exercises in next class we will get to know how these uh, different tunings or this tuning can be achieved so when we try to do the the actual pid implementation the actual pid implementation is in the discrete domain so this is the equation for pid so this is the proportional gain this is the integral and this is the derivative so you can actually take the laplace transform and then this equation it's converted into the laplace transform and then what we do is we actually implement a discrete pid control loop when we are implementing that in the autopilot one thing that i want to emphasize and you will notice this uh, people talk about this all the time known as integral wind up so whenever you have an a pid loop you always have to be careful about something called as wind up so this wind up takes place when there is significant error and what that this error does it actually increases the area under the the error curve and then basically that leads to a control input that is beyond the saturation so what this integral wind up does it essentially makes the system sort of unstable so what you want to do is you want to add some sort of saturation control to make sure that the integral wind up does not happen so integral wind up is something to be avoided in pid games to be avoided in pid tuning so and this specifically takes place when you have the error the difference between the actual and the desired that is significantly high and when that actually happens when you are trying to integrate that error as time goes on the area which is the the product of time multiplied by the integral uh, 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 and time multiplied by the error it becomes huge and when this becomes huge naturally the control input it becomes even larger and that control input may be beyond the limits of the actuator so that is actually something that not to be avoided so what we do is basically uh, there are some anti wind up strategies wherein what you do is you update before the saturation you update uh, after the saturation and then you find out the average and then you try to uh, apply this uh, limit Uh, when you anticipate integral wind up to be taking place now let me talk about the the simulation project and i will try to uh, work out the preliminary project in next class and try to give you an idea but what we need to do for the project we have to have the roll altitude loop and then we have to implement 
the certain values of air speed for example uh, air speed is equal to 17 meters per second and then what we need to do is we need to trim the aircraft and then actually add the step input to the road then what we need to do is when we look at the uh, the course altitude uh, attitude loop we have to change the values of chi and then basically see how the aircraft behaves then we have to look at the performance or the behavior of the rudder then we have to tune the pitch uh, loop and then what we finally have to do is we have to implement the full uh, attitude uh, longitudinal control you, uh, that actually goes from all the way to uh, takeoff uh, to the, the level flight and next part is just for your information it's not covered in the textbook but something that you can think about is what we did in the the, the slides we discussed so far we talked about the the loop closures there is an alternative way which is called as the total energy control which is something similar as lyapunov approach if you were to study the controller algorithms so in the con total energy control what you want to do is you want to minimize uh, the rate of change of energy and that is achieved by using suitable control laws so what you want to do is if uh, the system has kinetic energy and potential energy, you have the total energy and you have the energy difference. So what you do is you use this energy parameter and then develop a controller that will actually minimize uh, the energy. And this is something similar to the Lyapunov approach. So Lyapunov approach. And again, this is not discussed in the textbook, but this is for FYI. And uh, this is a very powerful technique. And this can be used for linear as well as nonlinear systems. So I would encourage you to take a look at how this into, uh, the energy control is implemented. And this is actually a very neat formulation. And there is a reference paper that talks about how it is done. Uh, the next iteration here is the controller gains that we have chosen they are not optimal they don't ensure that the system is performing optimally or the controller input is optimal so if you want to add optimality condition there is something called as linear quadratic regulator so this is called as linear quadratic regulator this is a class in itself so there, there are courses that deal with lqr control so the idea is you decide some sort of optimization parameter or cost function and minimize the cost function so that your controller gains are some sort of optimal so in this case here j is the, the cost and if you look at the, the canvas, I have added some uh, video lectures related to LQR control or optimal control. I would encourage you to take a look at that. But for this particular chapter, uh, we are not gonna talk about or do optimal control or we are not gonna use the, the total energy approach. But if you have any question, concerns or interest, I would be more than happy to talk about it uh, after we are done with the syllabus. That's it for today and I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions.